So guys, uh, welcome BJJ Storeroom, um, episode number, Anton? I think it's 22 now. Yeah, so 22, all the way up to 22, very good. Episode number 22, guys, uh, I'm here with Anton Minenko. Uh, we're both black belts here in Queensland, um, Australia, and we have a super guest here with us today, um, a guy that's very responsible for the development of Jiu-Jitsu in Australia. Uh, a, a pioneer of jiu-jitsu, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu in Australia as well. Uh, probably one of the first Brazilian black belts to teach in Australia. We'll find out more about that in a second. Paulo Guimarães, uh, from my same neighborhood, you know what I mean? So I have a, a, a very good um, a friendship with him. So it'll be amazing to have you here today with us, Paulo. Hey guys, all good? Yes, um, I was, uh, talk about the story, history, I was, the first black belt to open a gym in Australia, Brazilian black belt. There were three black belts here was John Will, John Donahue, and Peter De Bean was already, already black belts here in 2000. That's the year 2000 when I arrived here, end of the year after the Olympics, just after the Sydney Olympics. I was in Bali surfing and I came to here. And then I stayed, teaching some classes and like kind of illegal classes because I had a tourist visa, couldn't teach okay. at the time. But uh, but people didn't know about jiu-jitsu. Some people knew there was a, uh, a magazine called Blitz Magazine. There was no internet at the time, so Blitz Magazine was their way to know about martial arts here. So there was um, Jeremy Takori from Melbourne, and John Will found that magazine. And they started to, everybody wants to know things about martial arts, uh, buy that magazine and read and all the guys there and everything. And then I, and I arrived here, I was walking, I arrived, with, my student was in living in Manly, one of my guys. The, from Brazil, and I was in Bali. I came. I talked to him on the on Messenger and said, "Oh, you were going back to Brazil? Pass by Australia. Come surf with me." I came surf, and then um, stay in his house and walk, walking around one day, like in Manly here, there's some uh, uh, tennis courts and there's some shops. And I looked some. Well, there was a karate, like a karate. There was a karate school uh, in, a, in, a, in a shop through the glass, and I said karate. But the guys were doing some drawing and stuff. I said, "Oh." I will have a look. And I crossed the road to have a look, and there was a blue belt, a Rafael, blue belt, Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy teaching that. And I came in and just sit down and watch. And uh, when the class finished, I came to him, and I'm a, I'm, I'm play, I train jiu-jitsu too. I'm just passing by, you know, like my board's here to surf with my friend. And um, can I come for a row? I said, oh, yeah, come down, come down. And the next day, I went to train with him, and I got there, was black belt. And was, he was the blue belt instructor. And everybody, oh, black belt. And he said, I trained with them. And from there, there was another guy, Red. He was a white belt. You know, I, I didn't want to teach. I didn't want to. I'm not even thinking about staying in Australia. Just passing by for some months and went back to Brazil. I had a gym in Porto Alegre at the time in the South Brazil. And then um, then this guy, Red, said, oh, I have a gym. Come teach some classes. I said, man, I cannot, I cannot do anything like on the, on, the, on the books because I'm tourist. No, no, I pay you cash. Just come teach us in the gym. And it was close here. It was in Neutral Bay on the way to the city. And I went there like two times a week just to show him some moves and some guys he had there. Then suddenly, Brad went to this magazine, Blitz magazine, and make a, a half page. Brazilian black belt teaching my gym, blah, 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 name the gym, come training. Bro, from that day, when the magazine came out, start come people. One day was 10, one day was 20, one day was 30. People come from Newcastle, people come from everywhere. You know, white belts, blue belts. I think uh, Anton Lang was this any, any, only purple belt here, Elvis and Perosh. Obviously, not Sinozik and Perosh wore blue belts. And people start to come and do private classes and stuff. I said, oh, that's good business. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, <laughs> and then a guy called Tony Bonello, at the time he used to fight them in kind of MMA, he was a kickboxer, a big guy. He came to he came to the gym there. He saw the, the, the head, he came to the gym. Hey, man, I, I, I was in Hawaii when Hoyce fought the first UFC. You know, when I was trying try to train there, but then back in Australia, there's nowhere to train. Can I train if you start training for MMA? And then my visa expired. I renewed the visa two times. My visa expired. It was a tourist visa at that time. You cannot, could not change from tourist to something else. So I had to leave. And I came to the guys, guys, I have to leave. You know, after about six months, eight months, I have to leave. I'm sorry. Bye, bye, bye. And Tony came, no, you cannot leave. You cannot. No, can't leave. And I said, bro, <laughs> I cannot stay because they're like, this visa, I cannot change in Australia at this time. I have to get out from Australia, apply from outside to come back. And I have a gym in Brazil and go. And then, no, no, I have to introduce you to a guy here. And he took me to a Greek guy who has a big company. At the time, it was Fat Blaster. It was a product. He had some, some products to uh, vitamins and stuff. Fat Blaster was a, 
weight loss product, product yeah. that was like the biggest thing in Australia. You know, like everybody was using. And the funny thing was at that time, there was no, no caffeine allowed in products, uh, uh, diet products here. Was illegal, so you had to use herbs and stuff, and you got a combination that was beating everybody else. Yeah. Today, nowadays, you use caffeine in the products, you, you, you burn quick, but that time you couldn't. And then it was the best product in the market. So I went for a dinner with this guy, and Tony introduced me to him, Peter, his name. And then he said, "Oh man, I like UFC. I, I like this crazy, and uh, no, I sponsor some uh, some fighters. So let's see if we can sponsor you." Then we we went to the big lawyer, the best lawyer in Sydney here for immigration. And the guy said, look, there was never a case of, we can do special skills with you, like uh, special talent and stuff, but uh, there was never a case of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. You know, the only case I can find is Muay Thai because there were some Thai guys who already got the visa to Muay Thai. Here. And then he said, okay, so we're going to apply in special skills and uh, special talent and everything else. Nobody can do what you do in Australia. There's nobody in your level. So let's apply. They applied uh, for the visa. First time was refused because the guys didn't know what he was talking about. Then he said, okay, no, no problem because you're going to appeal. So I appealed the higher court. And he said, at, the, at this, you need, I need all your papers, all your certificates, all your things. You have to be active. So I was competing. I was going to Brazil to compete the awards and stuff. So everything, all the results. And then he applied. Then he, then he appealed for the higher court. And when he applied, they approved. So it was the first Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu visa in Australia. You no, know, true Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So it was the first black belt. Then I opened a gym here. So I was the first black belt to live here and open a gym. It was the first Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu visa in Australia. Then all the visas after that were based on my visa. So every case nowadays go to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. They, my one is the standard as the first one. So all the guys here, like Marcelo, Bruno, Marcelo from Gracie Baja, Bruno from Gracie Maita, Giant, and whoever, Bruno Alves, Brazilian everybody. Oh, I, I, can you sign for me the visa? Uh, depends. Do I like you? Okay, I like your sign. No, I don't like it. Fuck off. <laughs> I didn't sign. That's fine. So it was me and Peter. Peter Devine was the guy who signed my visa for the Australian Federation. So he was a big, big, big name on the visa too. So they had, they need the visa um, uh, signature by Peter and by me. So that was funny because it was not my intention at all. I came as a uh, surfer to stay some days with my friend. And then on the end, I stay in Australia. So I call Brazil, hey guys, uh, I'm staying in Australia. Just keep the gym, sell the gym. And, you know, so it was a, a like, I, 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 for, I can tell you, I think I'm the only guy who came to Australia teaching Jiu-Jitsu who was not wanting to do it. it. was not my intention at all. I just stay, you know, like, just I didn't come, we're going to study, we're going to do this, we're going to do that and stay. So. Paulo, I, I was going to bring something <laughs> up with you because, uh, I remember, like, Eros, like, we were so right on your description, Blitz Magazine was the only source of, like, martial arts community back then. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing, you had a really nice ad that you do, like, a rear naked choke or somewhere at the beach. I believe I believe it was Bondi. Remember that? So I was at the magazine as well. Um, and I saw you many times on the magazine. So I, I used to look up to your advertisers and go, oh, this is really nice, you know what I mean? And all that. So this is the, the, the dirty dozen, right? The dirty dozen people that the first Brazilians would know Blitz Magazine 100%. And the dirty dozen, the dirty dozen are the, the, the no ones, no, no Brazilian, but I was not the John Will and these guys, the dirty dozen, the dirty dozen, non Brazilian, the first 12 that they say they, they, they made a story, like the first 12 guys who got the, the black belt were non Brazilians. That, that, uh, that ad is funny because I put that ad in Blitz Magazine, but also put in Tracks Magazine, the Surface Magazine. Mm -hmm. Uh, I strip on the on the uh, and then uh, and on the on the you just say surf whatever you then please, and I choking the guy, you know because we have problems in the surf like everybody knows in the water there's lots of fights you know and there's local localism and if you are from this beach you cannot surf on that beach so I put that surf whatever you then please otherwise you're gonna die motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> but but surf whatever you please and I have lots of fights in the water but. Uh, but then people start to call me from Tracks magazine. Like, mm -hmm. but not, not the, the editors or anything. People who read magazine the surface. Some guys like this, hey man, what do you think? What do you think you are doing? Like you were inciting violence at the beach. And then I said, bro, which planet do you live? Violence is already there. I just yeah. tell him that you learn Jiu Jitsu, you can stuff whatever you want, you know? And uh -huh. whatever happens, you are, you are safe. And yeah. oh, no, no. And other guys calling me like, hey man, that's very cool. Oh no, no where, can I, where can I learn Jiu Jitsu? No, I have problems sometimes going stuff for the, for the places. Uh, I said, bro, just 
look for a gym where you are, you know, come train with me because it's very safe. And on the end of the day was not to, to incite violence, but say that you were safe training jiu-jitsu. Like everybody knows, though, so it was, was a funny idea. There was lots of response on the day. <laughs> Paolo, and the fight's one... happening all the time. We don't, we don't look for that. Paolo, just one question. We, know, we, we like to talk a lot about, like, everyone's childhood and stuff like that as well and how they were introduced to martial arts. Can you talk a little bit about um, your childhood, your upbringing, and then also where you were introduced to martial arts, like through that time of your life, like your early early childhood? Uh, yeah, um, well, I, I live in Rio, so I live in the, the suburbs, like everywhere, right? So I live in Ipanema, that's uh, close to Copacabana. Copacabana is very famous. Yeah. And when I was about, I think, six, seven years old, my mother put me in judo, because in Brazil, everybody does... If you were, at that time, no, do they remember that? If you're a kid, you do judo and swimming. If like if you're a boy, if you're a girl, normally you used to do the girls do ballet and swimming. So swimming was compulsory, yeah. right? Because every kid swimming is very good sport for anyone. So kids, so my mother put me in swimming. They, they, and in Brazil, there's clubs, you no know, clubs where you have a sports club. You have tennis courts, basketball courts, uh, um, soccer, everything Athletics in the club. club. So we go. Yes. So then we, my mother put me in the judo, me and my brother, my brother's three years younger, put me as in judo and swimming. So I used to swim in the morning before school, go to school, come back. End of the day, like two or three times a week, I used to, to go to judo. Then though, that was until I was 12, 13. And then you moved to another suburb. That's Baja, you know, where, do the, where do the, we used to live in the same condominium and where Gracie Baja is from. Gracie Baja, actually, Baja is the suburb. You know, yeah. Grace, not everybody, they, people don't know. Grace Baja is the Gracie from the Baja suburb. So I moved there, and um, in this condominium we live, I was not in Panama. There was no judo, but there was a club and there was things. So my mother one day saw some guys walk around with geese, kids. I said, oh, that's the same shit. Let's just put him there. And it was jiu-jitsu. You know, so that's how I started. And then the teacher was Flappy Bering, the, the, the head of the Bering, Bering family. And he was uh, Eddie Gracie Black Belt. And his sons, Marcelo Bering, who died, and Silvio Bering were about, I think, were purple belt at the time, blue to purple belt. And there was lots of kids, you know, like around. And Duda was, Duda is younger than me, but Duda was there and met them the same way. So they used to teach in the, in the economy. And so I used to, I started to do Jiu Jitsu. And that, you know, like, and then it was a good way also to meet the other kids around and stuff. So that was the, the start. And then after Flavio Bering stopped teaching, and uh, stopped teaching, or stopped teaching there. And then we started training Silvio and Marcelo with the brothers for a long time. From then, Marcelo left to Australia for a while and then moved to Sao Paulo, that's the other state. And then the, the gym split. So Marcelo was training for Hickson at the time and um, from Purple Belt and took George Pereira as well, who was training first, my friend, and do the nose, the friend too. And then both of them were training for Hickson. And Silvio was training for uh, Osvaldo, uh, Osvaldo Osno, uh, uh, Barreto, the Barreto brothers. Uh, what's the name of the game? Uh, Alvaro Barreto. Alvaro Barreto. So both were, both left, but then Marcelo left Brazil and I, we, the, the gym split. So some people went to see with Silvio to Alvaro Barreto, or the people went to with George, uh, on the other side that was from Hickson School. But that was the, the, the very beginning. And then Duda was, uh, Duda is very young, much younger than me. Duda was a kid, you know, like when I was maybe 16 or something. Duda was what, eight? What, what? What? How old are you? How old are you now? What's the difference? I'm a Highlander. I cannot tell you. Okay. <laughs> That's a secret. Don't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> now, I was always, yeah, the, the, like the young ones, you know, the ones that look up to people and see the things happen and go, whoa. Oh. That's how I started Jiu-Jitsu. I started to watch you guys having trouble, you know, fights, you know what I mean? Things are like, man, I have to do this thing too, just to protect myself, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that time was good because that time was like, the way to prove was to fight, you know, like you, I remember the first time, the first, uh, maybe it was white to blue belt, the first fight I had. And then because we trained, the, the thing is that it's like uh, people don't understand. Sometimes you say, look, you is going to save your life. You is for self-defense. Train here one day in the street. You're going to happen. You're going to, you're going to use it. And then I remember the first time I had a fight. I don't remember. There was a bigger guy. I don't know if it was at the beach or somewhere. And suddenly the fight start on the end. Finisher was mounted on the guy. I said, oh my. <laughs> what did I do? I probably I grabbed the guy, took him down, mount, hold him, or maybe punch his head. You know, like, like you don't, you don't even react, don't even know, just react. So when you see, oh, jiu jitsu works, and then that day you realize, okay, jiu jitsu really works for for everything, not just for competition, or just though, so, because many of the kids they just do the things, do the things, do the things, and uh, 
and they don't don't understand because they never happened to them. Another day, I had a kid. Actually, my kid, my 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 son, Altor, is nine, but he used to be in kindergarten. I think he was five or something, or at five in school. And a kid, a lot of little kid, that tough little kid, came and push his, his friend, and then push him again, push him. I was waiting for to go to school, right? So before school starts in the, in the grass area in the school. And then um, the other kid used to play rugby. Five years old kid played rugby, but now that he has a reaction. He took his friend down, hold his friend in a headlock, mount on his friend, and just stay there, ha, 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 making fun. And I called Thor, look, when he pushed, you take him down. And then uh, and they came to push Thor, avoid him, and he came to push again, and um, Thor clinched him, but the boy grabbed Thor by the neck, and the side headlock and put him on the floor. Well, better luck for the boy that week, we trained Escape from headlock for the five years old. Bad luck for the boy. So Thor, the guy who had him in headlock, Thor turned on the knees, put the arm over the shoulder, put the head out, escape, push the boy's face on the grass, sit on his head, call his friend, and his friend sit on his head too. So the two boys now sit on the boy's head and just do nothing, right? Just keep sitting on the boy's head, but escape from headlock. And the teacher came, what's happened? What's happened? I said, nothing's happened. He's just playing. And then that's it. The kid never bullied them again. So when you uh, Condition to do the training and happens, you don't even think. And that's why I think the, the best thing. So, like, do the same. We had lots of fights there. We used to have lots of fights, but like at the beach, we used to have lots of fights in Brazil when the mall, like, was, I remember, right? High and Gracie, How, Hansel Gracie, us, the guys from Kerbama, because of very close neighborhood. We used to go to the, to the, how to say, the pinballs in that area when they have here the fliperama. Yeah. Uh, flipping up, but here they have a, uh, is the, how do you say in, in, in English? Like when they have those areas, they have the pinball with the uh, arcade. Arcade game, yeah. There was, a, there was a big arcade in the mall, in that one big mall there. And everybody from Jiu Jitsu, like every, all the kids sit around the arcade and play and have fun. And sometimes there were big fights in the arcade because all the kids come from other way and big pushing. <laughs> it was fun. Well, fun for, for fighters, right? Not for everyone. <laughs> yeah, not for but the never, guys never, never, fight. never fight. For bullying, we always we always fight because someone come and push us. Ah, oh, but you can say that, yeah. But there was there was some little gangs there of kids. But ah. That was a fun part. Um, Paulo, what what um, is that? Is there any funny stories that you remember? Like a funny story that you can remember? I remember a really funny one because I I trained it with I trained with George when I was about uh, 13, 14. and I remember. He used to, and I was I was the youngest one, like literally the youngest one in adult class. And I remember he used to, everyone training, and then suddenly he would turn it off the lights and say, fight. And everyone has open hand, you can go as much as you want, and you can just hear that noise like, pa, 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 you know? And, um, and I think he um, made people super uh, prepared and conditioning, conditioned for, you know, to get, uh, if you have trouble to be able to, to, Really to, to defend yourself, yourself yeah. to protect yourself. And um, I was thinking back as well this week to talk to you. And one thing that I realized, you know, look at you, looking up to you, to, to Gigo, to Leldala, to Nino, and to all the other guys that were training with George at that time, he made excellent, uh, he made excellent jiu-jitsu coaches Uh, and also business people, because, you know, people never give up. People found a better ways to do things, you know. So it was a very good, when you think about, when you look back, it was very good training, you know. Yeah, it's like, what, what, what let's say it was tough training. It was not tough training, people say sometimes. It was tough training. It's tough, but it's real. You know? Like, you first, prepare you to defend yourself. Second, prepare uh, in order to never give up, you know, to trust in yourself, self-confidence, to be, like, focused in what happens, because the training in the dark, You don't see, so you have to feel, you know. So you have feelings like and and uh, be aware of everything that can happen or see what situation you are. So analyze the situation. Like if you are in the dark, you put your back to the wall, you know, or fighting double because the other guys protect your back. Or and other 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 um, instincts that bring to you during the fight that, like you said, you can use in life. And that's very true. You know, I think it's very important, and that's why sometimes uh, I doubt a lot of these new people teaching jiu-jitsu, they don't have it. Like one, one of my students here who has is a black belt here now. At my gym, I used to do the same as George in Brazil. I used to close the gym, turn the lights, turn the lights off sometimes. Like, no, in my, my training until today, nobody drinks water. 
There's no water. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> There's no water. They were going to stop in the middle of the thing. Oh, you are in a, in a, you are in a very important thing doing. You're going to worry about the water. You're about, oh, you're in a fight. You're going to worry about the water in the street. Oh, no, just a second. You have some water. Had some juice. Want a juice? Want a biscuit? Okay, let's fight again. No. You know, so we will have to be con concentrating all the other things are out of your mind. So you clear your mind and concentrate what you're doing. It doesn't matter if you're doing a, a doctor, doing an operation, or if you are an engineer, or if you're working in construction, whatever. So concentrate what you're doing, otherwise you're in danger. When construction, don't concentrate, you lose your finger, you know, something fall in your head. So that keeps you focused. And nowadays, of these soft jiu-jitsu, it's not soft because it's not hard to bash each other. Soft because of discipline. It's soft, of course, because like a, no effort. You know, we are we are we are giving prizes to the kids for doing nothing. You know, yeah. for the adults as well, but for the kids worse. Like Very true. In, in school nowadays, you don't repeat the year anymore. So you cannot you can take zero in every every subject in school, you go to the next year. So where are you forming? One day uh, some years ago I read um, an article of Bill Gates in the New York Times, and he was saying, This generation is lost. It's a sh shit. What are you doing for a new generation? Why? Because he said, look, in my time, you have to, these kids take too easy. And every, they are the princes and the princesses in the universe. Everything, oh, I'm sorry, oh, you do this, oh, you do that. When they come to the, the real market, the work market, you know, they go to the company. And nobody going to serve a cough. No, no, it's not okay that you are late for your, to give your thing. It's not okay that you, you slow down your work. You're going to be fired. So they come from a uh, make-believe wonderland until yeah. university, yeah. and then they they jump in straight in the in the work market. That is a big competition head to head. And Bill Gates was saying that that, that article. He said, "Look, these kids don't have a chance. So don't teach your kids like that." In in America, it's, it's the same in Australia. Kids don't repeat school anymore. Make them study. Make them go hard. Don't give them everything they want. Make them give the value for what they want. If they want a, a Christmas present, they have to be good for Santa. Santa just give presents to the good kids, you know. So they have to work hard. They have to be like. In, on the on the spot, they have if they had something to go. My my son plays soccer, right? The only one asked. And uh, some days it's raining, fucking I don't know, everything in there here, like so rainy. If the, the 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 club he plays here doesn't send an email say that the, the it's canceled, the train is canceled, he's going. Now, I remember one day last year, or the other year before, was a rain that the horrible day, wind, rain, cold, winter. Oh, no, I have to go. Yes, I have to go. There's a team waiting for you. Go and play. He went to play. I was there under the umbrella of my jacket. And he was playing the whole morning. Came back in the afternoon. Was sick. Bad luck. You are sick, but you did what you had to do. You know, so that teaches responsibility. It's teaching teamwork. Teaching to get efforts. To look for his for his his goals. And that's what it is lacking today. I think in education in general, not just jujitsu, yeah. not just like uh, soccer, not just whatever, just Let's teach, no, and the others too. How many oh. others come? How many others come to the to the to the school there? Oh, I'm tired. You're tired. Keep going. Oh, but the, you are tired. You defend yourself. And that was Paul. And that was very important part of the 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 jiu jitsu or the martial arts for the individual the whole time. You know, it was actually the most important part that was given to the individuals, and that's being uh, completely missed out. And uh, I think, uh, luckily. We have places that are still thinking, like, as we agree a lot with what you're saying, that still have that uh, tradition and they know what they're doing and they know the whole package and they can provide the whole package for the students, uh, you know, regardless of the new times we're living and we can bring it that importance into it. Yeah, for sure. Yes, I, think, I, think, yeah, I, think, I think that training, that training, the, the traditional training is very important, of course. The guy wants to be a competitor, world champion. Okay, train a lot here, but you have to learn the self-defense. You have to learn this. Like the other day, you remember that guy who got slapped two times on the face and did nothing. Ten times world champion, 20 times Abu Dhabi champion, 30 yeah. times uh, Galax champion. <laughs> Man. <laughs> what? What? What's think... like about them two slaps on the face and do nothing? Yeah. You die, but you do something. No, what the hell is that going on? Yeah. I think I think what you're talking about also is like particularly Western countries. You've removed a lot of consequence for things, like you said. The guy doesn't give the um, school work on time. Oh, it's okay. You had a bad day. Oh, and and the thing is, is 
what people don't understand, I think, in the long term is it's not actually good for everybody. Sometimes you have to be harsh to do the best thing for people. And, and I don't know what has happened or what's changed in society, not, not only at school or whatever, but we're, we're kind of moving towards this thing where you always focus on how people feel and you have to make them feel nice. But unfortunately, focusing on how people feel isn't always the best thing for them. And there's this weird kind of like attitude that everyone has now where exactly like you're saying, you give a medal if they win or lose, doesn't matter. You give rewards to people that aren't doing the things they need to do. And this is a real problem. And we talk about this a lot on, on lots of the other podcasts is jujitsu is the slap in the face that you get from reality. Because if you don't know what to do, you're going to get smashed. Just like when they go to a real job and they can't get a job or they get fired within two weeks because they're swearing or they don't know how to operate or they can't do what they want. Jiu-Jitsu introduces you to reality earlier, especially if you start as a kid. And I think this is something that we try to talk about a lot. And it's really interesting to notice after the 20 or so people that we've interviewed, they all kind of have the same idea. Like, you know, you, you can't bullshit jujitsu. You either can do it or you cannot. You either got caught in the triangle or you're escaped. And it just makes people accountable for what's actually happening in their lives as opposed to I'm going to make up an excuse and it's going to be fine because I can talk my way out of it. You can't talk your way out of jiu-jitsu. You know what I mean? That's true. Yeah, and then, and then other sports or anybody like, okay, if the kid has a problem, if the kid, uh, and that's what you have to do, another relationship with the instructor and the, the student. Like we are based, martial arts are based in the old story of the master and the, the disciple, right? Yeah. The disciple find the master. Yeah. And the master chose you see, that's the right disciple. So one master, one disciple, that's where it comes from. And then you become the master and then another disciple comes and stuff. But because, um, of course, it's not more one in one, now it's lots of disciples. So you have to see who are the real ones. You also have to analyze. Some people have problems. You know, some people have problems in coordination or they're timid or they are too aggressive or this or that. So we put you in your place and you, like, let's say the guy, I had a very good story of a kid here when I had a Jimmy Bondi some years ago before before I move. And uh, a father came with a kid and said, oh, Paulo, maybe the kid was about seven, seven, eight. He said, oh, my, my, my kid, I want to start my kid in jiu-jitsu because he has a problem. There's a bully kid in school and he's always bullying him. And uh, you know, like, can push him and grab him and do these things and take his stuff. And I said, okay, we need to train, no problem. I knew the problem with the kid. So I was very timid already, a bit scared. And we start to build up his confidence and start to train with the audience and losing up. And um, about, I don't know, two, three months after, he came, he was coming two, three times a week, this kid, to the, to the, to train. And about two months after, maybe three months, he came with another kid, a friend. I said, okay, come in. And then the father came to me, hey, Paul, come here. What's up? Uh, this is the bully. I said, what? You bring the bully here? But your kid's not afraid of you. No, no, my kid got so confident that the bully came to bully one day and he just stand up for the bully. And then that's it. The bully didn't bully anymore. Now the bully wants to be his friend and want to learn what he learned. So the bully cannot be bullied by the artists who are kids. <laughs> it was perfect. So the perfect story. And the bully came, became his friend, you know, and, became, and also the bully attitude disappeared because now he saw that all the kids could be tougher than him. So he started training and wasn't too nice kids. So that's the thing. Like you have to be exposed to your problems sometimes and you have to see what the stu student is doing. Let's say that guy who hurts everyone, you're going to talk to him, man, don't hurt everyone. Don't hurt everyone. Don't squash the white belt. One day, what are you going to do? You're going to bash him a little bit. You know, they're going to give him what he, he's giving to the others. I oh, do like it. Oh, no, I don't like it. Exactly. So if you don't like it, don't do it to the others. You know, because they are here to learn. They are here like, like to, to have fun. Not that guy, the guy like you and is squashing everyone. Or oh, the guy, I had another girl uh, here. She's about nine now. She came two years ago training. And she was very shy. Very like those guys like this. You know, his, her father came to me and said, look, Paul, she, you know, she's very timid then in school and stuff she doesn't now the girl comes in the gym first thing she comes she comes jumping around and smiling jumping and said how was in school everybody's their friend so you change because you change your attitude and maybe the parents sometimes don't do it the parents just protect the kid oh they're afraid and let's 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 move in from another, to another school and to another school doesn't doesn't work you have to face the problem so uh, jiu-jitsu helps a lot but all the coaches not all, all the all the things can help you just the attitude not like Always, oh, champ, oh, this, oh, don't do it, don't do it, don't, don't, don't touch him, don't push him. 
You have to defend yourself because I always say to the people in the in the when they come in the match, nobody gonna help you here. Just you, not your father, not your mother, not your brother, not your not your gun. Your gun is outside. <laughs> you have a gun. Nothing gonna help you here. You have to save yourself or you tap. Tap, tap until you get better. And everybody gets better. That's another another message. Everybody gets better. There's nobody that doesn't learn. Like whatever you have problems like coordination or, or strength or flexibility, you get better because everybody gets up like belts. Like everybody you know, grows up, cannot stop it. So that's what we learn. We learn and we teach them. And they have to keep this tradition. It cannot be a business owner. It cannot be that guy who comes and pay the money and do his workout and go, for this, there's fitness gyms. No. Go there. You want to just work out? You go there. Oh, but but I just want to lose some weight and do jiu jitsu. Okay. Very good. You come to you lose some weight or you put some weight on or whatever you like, but you're going to learn other things. But parallel to that, you're going to learn respect, discipline, uh, attitude, self confidence, focus, all these things that is natural. People think, oh, I have to. No, don't have to. It will, it will happen to you. Like if you go in the water every day, you're going to learn to swim or you're going to die. But normally you learn to swim, learn to float, you know, and you are safe. It's a good point. Yeah, you definitely learn a lot of different things about your character by default. It's not even your choice. It just happens. Yeah, it's a good point. I was, I was, these days I bought these, these days or three days ago, I bought uh, the Hickson book, Brief, this last yeah. one. I read, did you like it, Paulo? Really good, eh? I like a lot. And he talks about this, you know, when he, he talks about his levels, when he touch the guy, when you shake the guy's hand, he feels what the guy does. And when you're on the mats, you cannot escape like we were talking before. I cannot escape. You're going to be afraid. You're going to be scared. You're going to be this and that. But you work on those things until you get better, until you pass it. You know, you see, oh, that guy is tough. But when some tough guy dash, is squashing, he, he starts to scare, get scared because not used to the situation. Okay, now he gets used to the situation and get better. So it's, we martial arts in general, like, are very good for you. Like Karate Kid, you're watching TV. Every kid loves, you know, Kung Fu Panda. You know, all the story of the the growth of the person, the, the improvement of the guy, the Fat panda now is the, the dragon master, whatever he is. <laughs> Strongest warrior. <Yeah. laughs> Paulo, um, uh, look, I I um, would like to know like a little bit like, so when you arrived, you know, there was, you were the first one and then followed up. I was at the time in Sydney, so I actually um, watched and, and lived through it. So there was then uh, Marcelo and Bruno, right? And you guys at the time, uh, opened the New South Wales Federation of Jiu-Jitsu, which was, uh, uh, at the time, was a great move for Jiu-Jitsu. I remember how you guys started from basically nothing, and uh, then you just working. Uh, I remember there was like Brazilian drums in the crowd at the beginning. Did you remember that? <laughs> Sydney University. Competition. And um, how we actually evolved. And can you tell us like a little bit about that beginning and what it it became right now. How is the federation right now, and what is the jiu-jitsu in New South Wales as well? Yeah, what happened was, uh, when I arrived, like I said, I went to teach this gym, and they got my sponsor and stuff. Uh, about six months after, maybe almost one year, a bit more than six months, maybe nine months, almost one year after Marcel arrived, and he moved to Manly too. Marcel from Gracie Bar, he was a new black belt from Gracie Bar, and he moved here, I think, to study for his girlfriend. And then six months after that, Bruno. The same came to study here and uh, from Grace from Maita, from from Holly, Holly, his Holy student, and um, and we three live in Manly. So like it was a small Brazilian community at the time. Everybody knew everyone. So we met and oh, okay, you do jiu jitsu, jiu black belt. Yeah, three black belts. So um, Marcel opened a, at this place where the karate guy was was teaching. Where I met Rafael, the first blue belt here, the first guy blue belt I met here. Uh, Marcel started to teach it there. There. I was teaching Bondi because I, uh, Peter, the guy was supposed to open a, put some mats or put together something in Bondi. And Bruno started teaching the city. So we divide this, the, the town in, like the mafia, we divide the town in regions. No? So that's your region, that's <laughs> in areas. So nobody interfered in each other area. So that was the division of, the, of Sydney. Three areas. Plus, there was Larry Papadopoulos here too, like where Bruno was teaching. He was a shooter fighter, he's still around. I've been there, I trained there too. Yeah, yes. So, so we had three areas, right? And then we started to jiu-jitsu. Not many people knew jiu-jitsu at the time. Some fighters knew it, so people started to come. And um, so we said, we sit together and said, man, how are we going to make this grow here? If you want, we maybe could live from jiu-jitsu in Australia. We didn't know yet, but maybe we could live because lots of people come and the sports growing. And how we make it grow? 
So we said, okay, the only way to grow is making competitions because competitions attract people. First, the guys who are training, they have a, a aim to train for. They have a target. They train for the competition, right? So they're not just training. Yeah, now I'm going to do golf. Now I'm going to do tennis. to get bored. So train for, for, for a target. Second thing, like in competitions, they come and the girlfriends come, the friends come. And so people start to talk to each other. There was no internet or this thing. So people talk to each other and then start to bring more friends, more friends, and you can start to grow. And uh, also you can make some money. No, so we had in the gym I was teaching Bondi, the place I was teaching, there was a big basketball court. And we said, okay, so let's create this federation and make the first competition. So how we call it? So, okay, we went to, to fair trade and registered the federation as an association, not as a company. And uh, <clears throat> created, we are the three directors. We got some more people, uh, Luke Besson, Angela Gracie, uh, husband also entered first and like a part of the federation lead people. I think it was good because it was Australian. So we had the federation. Then we started the first competition. The first competition in Bondi had 60 people, 20 from me, 20 from Marcelo, 20 from Bruno, right? White belts all. And then we did it. It was quick. We carried the match from the gym to the to there all night and fix it and, it and start to explain the rules to the guys and had the first federation, first competition. From there on, it started to grow like we expected, right? There was Anthony Lang was purple belt, Elvis in promotion, blue belts. They had gyms. There was like some guys from Luke Best in Newcastle, some other guys around. And then we start to bring people together. We, we start to advertise for friends and stuff. And then um, that was 2001, right? And then we start to grow. The second competition already had maybe 80 people. The third one had 90 and keep going until we start to make a circuit. So I think the second year, 2002, we make a, made a circuit. So four competitions, we score points and stuff. And start to grow, people start to learn. Um, then after that, we, until today, we have, I think now the, our last competition had 1300 uh, entries and it was very good. We had to go to two days now from now on, but there was also, um, uh, the Australian Federation, Peter De Binder in Melbourne, right? And they had the Victorian Championship. So we became the main competition in, in New South Wales. They became the main competition there. And I remember you do that came to me. Okay. Let's do something in Queensland. Because you're moving to Queensland, so we start to, to organize some papers to for you there, explain you how to do it, and you start the things there too. So it was was very good. And the federation brought us a lot of uh, uh good good return because organization and well organized. Because there was one competition here, ISKA, they had jiu-jitsu. But was that thing you arrived on the day you put your name, oh no, you put your name, there you fight that now, fight that it was a big mess. And we showed them that the federation, like with the organized. Uh, jiu-jitsu competition was safer and was like more more like under there were more rules so everybody knew the rules we were under the international federation so it gave us a lot of credibility and nowadays the federation is going very good all the all australia has federations now you know in contact with all of them we we in contact with peter peter was peter Devine was a very good supporter for for us at the time and we're still working together sometimes and that's it so in 99 when was 2001, we started the federation. 2007, I did a, a cage fight. I bought a cage. I built a cage, actually. I did a cage fight competition here. Paulo, let me just... let. Sorry to interrupt you. Let me just make a question here. It's still about this uh, history of the beginning. Um, at that time, would would New South Wales you be uh, more... Would be, the scene of jiu-jitsu was bigger than Melbourne or not? This is something I never... I don't know about it. No, Melbourne is the biggest because they, Melbourne, actually, interesting fact is the Australian Federation is the first Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation under IBJJF outside of Brazil. Yes. Before, with the BS. And then they were already had the Victorian Championship and they had the, the I don't know if they had the Pan Pacific, but they, they had big competitions there. And they had three black belts there was John Donahue, Hill, Peter Devin, and John Will. Right here, there was no black belts. So when I arrived here and Marcelo and Bruno arrived, were the three black belts here. So we're three there and three here. So we start to build up, and they were better. They had more competition. We, I used to go, I actually, they had the Pan Pacific. I used to go fight the Pan Pacific there with my students. And then after, about, I think, about five years, we were even. So maybe in 2001, they were there, and in five years, we were even, and we were fighting toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. And then I got my student, uh, in 2003, I went to Brazil, took three black, two, three blue belts of my students. Uh, Philippa. And all four of us won the World Championship, World Cup, actually. One of was the girl, wasn't it? The, uh, well, it was Philippa the girl. Philippa, yeah. It was two guys. Yeah, and there was me. So they were all three fighting the blue belt. 
And we fought two competitions because that time was two, com- two big competitions. Everybody fighting both. So it was the World Cup one weekend and the weekend after was the World Championship. Right? There were two federations in Brazil. So one was first weekend and one the second. So everybody's like Jacare and all the Roger Grace, everybody else like fight both. And uh, them and my, everybody, all the, the good guys at the time. And then um, we got there two weeks before training for training with my, my friends, James Diego and Tata and all these guys. And then uh, we went to fight. So I won the black belt. At the time in World Cup, in the World Cup, uh, Filippo won the blue belt heavyweight. Uh, uh, Andrew won the blue belt uh, um, middleweight, and and Dave won the blue belt lightweight. That weekend, the weekend after, we fought the world championships. I got fifth. I lost in the quarterfinals. Uh, I think Andrew and Dave lost, and Filippo went to the same finals and lost uh, almost in the same finals. So she got third, and then he came back to Australia. So it was the, it was the first time that. Any Australian you need to fight, they got a good, big, big, big result outside. So we were the first at the time. So the first uh, Australian was was in the um, Beats magazine, of course, made a cover, made everything else was was on a uh, Sports Illustrated here in Australia. Like was there? Oh, Jiu Jitsu brought uh, four gold medals, hundred percent. Was in Tatami magazine. The Tatami magazine was a big magazine in in, uh, in Brazil at the time. And the cover, like, was the Australians bring bring hundred uh, percent. Uh, results for four competitors, four gold medals, or some little things with us there. So it was was amazing. It was the first time that we had some projection outside there. Now then I remember back, you won again. You had a very strong, uh, strong team back then. You know, still do, um, and you had a, a very nice uh, competi- competition career as well. Um, it's funny when you said about the five years difference between Sydney and Melbourne because that's how I describe to people. When they ask me, oh, what's the difference between Sydney and Queensland? And I say, man, we are five years behind them, but we're going to catch up, you know, because we keep working, you know, people keep enjoying, etc. cetera, Jitsu is growing. But I always use the same definition you used uh, for Melbourne and, and New South and Sydney. I used to to Queensland and, and New South Wales. Yeah, you um, need time. Yeah. You need a bit of time to teach, but in the way you teach. And also now, you see nowadays, like Australians everywhere, you know, like uh, uh, Levi Jones and uh, and uh, Lachlan Gills and uh, all the other guys, like Australians winning everywhere, the girls winning everywhere. So yeah. Australia, I think nowadays is the same level for on the world level. No, not of course, not everyone, but not everyone anywhere. Brazil is there, and then comes I think America, the United States, and then the rest of the world, including Australia. But I think Australia is already catching America, like in the quality of fighters, in the level of uh, Jiu Jitsu, in the number of uh, of uh, respecting the the, well, the, the population difference, right? You get the numbers. It's such a small number, but you have people, uh, Anto Mineco is another one, like you have people that are achieving like world level, world medalists. That's that started to happen. You're right. Absolutely agree with you on that, Paulo. But look, people developing I, into like, uh, the, in a, in a, just to, I was talking about the, I made the, the MMA event. And that time, that's interesting story as well, because it was 2007. We made that, I don't hear fighting stuff. And then we put, Nida here, the National uh, Institute of Dramatic Arts, where Nicole Kidman came from, where Russell Crowe came from. So like the theater people. And we ran that place and made a cage fight in there. And the next day, we still have the back of the page. Sydney Morning Herald, bloodbath on the Nida theater. So guys punching stuff, and it was not legal. But it was not illegal as well, you know? So we made the cage fighting. In 2009, so it was 2007, a bit of 2008, we did four events. And uh, lots of guys fought. And um, in... Uh, in 2009, the I was in the gym in Bondi still, and the guy called me. The someone called me and Paulo, Paulo, phone for you. Who is it? Oh, it's the Department uh, of Sports of New South Wales. It's the minister, whatever. Who else? Sports minister. I said, what the fuck? this guy wanted me. And he called Paulo. Is this Paulo? Uh, my assistant, uh, the PR for the minister, whatever it is. And you have to help us. I said, what happened? It's a fight. I'm doing that now. <laughs> then they said, no, was no, no. Uh, UFC wants to come to Australia. And we don't know anything about it. Can you uh, clarify us about rules and uh, safety and everything? Because the press is on top of us saying that's a like bar- uh, barbaric sports. There's a uh, men's cockfighting and stuff. It's too aggressive to Australia. Can you please help us? I said, guys, okay. So sit down. Let's talk about I'm going to send everything I have about information of the safety, like rules, uh, doctors, uh, everything else, all the preparation. Then we send to them. And they said, oh, man, thank you. You're going to save us from the press. And that year, in 2009, that was actually 2008. 2009 was the first year of UFC in Australia. Was in Sydney here, the first UFC. And then after that, 
jiu-jitsu had a big boom, you know, because then people start to see what was groundwork. Because you used to tell, until 2008, you talk to people, jiu-jitsu, uh, uh, capoeira. Oh, no, no, it's kind of judo, but with different rules. But I was here too. No, no, no. no. I, once UFC hit the pubs, people, oh, jiu-jitsu. Now they know what jiu-jitsu. Nowadays, you go there and talk jiu-jitsu. Oh, yeah, yeah. Benic jokes and ambas and kimuras and stuff. So now everybody knows about jiu-jitsu. That UFC was a big push for us in total in Australia for jiu-jitsu. That was a, a big year in 2009. Uh, for, before 2009 and after 2009, from your, uh, when UFC came in here, was amazing for us. Who was fighting on that UFC at that time, Paolo? You were? Who, no, who who was fighting on the UFC at that time, on 2009? 2009? Man, I don't remember anymore, anymore at like that time. But what big, I don't remember. I think um, 2009 was the end of Pride. I think Pride finished in 2007. So everybody moved to the UFC, all the big fighters. You know, they bring, I don't remember who was a champion. Did they bring ambassadors? Like, did they bring, like, Hoist Grace to, like, people to... To like, you know, as the first one in Australia, sometimes they so could do that. They brought the champions. They brought, I don't know who was, was the champion, but there were some Brazilian champions. Oh, yeah, they brought the big, they made good big fights here. Mm -hmm. Was Minotauro, if he came. I think it was Minotauro, Ken Velasquez. Uh, Ken Velasquez was the champion, uh, if I'm not wrong. I, feel, I think it was Ken Velasquez, heavyweight champion, then after he lost to Verdun. I think it was Anderson Silva, was still on, still, still his. Middle years of it, mm -hmm. uh, on the on the I think maybe Brock Lesnar on the big ones. Brock Lesnar, Randy Couture, Randy Couture was end of career. Brock Lesnar, I think was coming up. Yeah, I think it was this were these guys. Power it was a big it was a big thing. They brought lots of people. They big big big. I went to the first UFC. There was uh, was Minotauro came last. Minotauro lost, knocked out. I I actually Minotauro went to Gold Coast after this fight, and. Uh, my wife uh, used to be really good friends of, of him, did his house back in Brazil. So um, we catch up catch up with him on the Gold Coast, roll with him, went for dinner. Was really He's a very nice guy eh, on a personal level, but really a 100, 100 guy, 100% 100 guy, you know what I mean? Yeah, everybody says, I don't know him personally, but everybody says he's a very nice guy. But what's this? And then from UFC help us a lot. If people say, oh, UFC sure. helps you, yes, yeah, helps everywhere. When you start to see that people can go to the floor and the fight doesn't stop, in general public, I mean, no, not, not not us, because we know, like, fighters know, but, like, general public start to realize. Nowadays, you see, like, you go to every UFC in the pub, and uh, everybody knows all the moves in Jiu-Jitsu, even if they don't train, right? Very true. So, Paolo, just, just one thing I want to ask. Um, there's a lot of students that do want to compete, like you're talking about. Do you have any advice for people that are thinking about competing um, or... Um, that are competitors, but they're kind of like unsure. Like there, a lot of a lot of students always come and ask, and like, oh, you know, what should I do? How should I prepare? Do you have any advice for people that are really thinking about competing in jiu-jitsu? So is competing or just competing for for experience? Uh, anyway, both, both, either way, yeah. Both, both ways, both ways. You have just to to compete. You have to be in your best. You cannot compete if you don't have gas. Like you, even if you win the fight, the next fight you, you die. You no, know, so you have to be in your best. So you have to take care of your body. So how do you take care of your body? Eating well, sleeping well, eating uh, like uh, uh, exercising, and also I think outside exercise of your main sport are good. Let's say the Formula One racer, maybe he plays golf or play tennis for fun. And cut his later eleven times world champion. He loves to play golf as well. You know, like uh, you have a second sport. Some lots of jiu-jitsu guys they lose, they close the beach. They go surfing. You do not need to be the best on the other sport. Just change your no, refresh your mind. Don't be too focused as well. Like some people like just paranoia that, okay, relax. You have a life too. Oh, but should I party? Should I do this? No, you slow down that thing, right? But those things, but uh, in the first thing you have to be in shape. So put yourself in shape. Oh, but no, you don't go compete if you cannot like grow for five minutes. You know, so you can increase your training as well. Increase your training means like uh, train, let's say, train three times a week. Okay, the only time I can train is three times a week. So train harder three times a week, you know, or train five times a week. So have some rest. Also, that, that's the thing. Like people who train too much, forget about the rest. Rest is part of training. So if you train Monday to Friday or Monday to Saturday, Sunday do nothing. You relax, you go to the movies, you think about something else. Your brain needs you know, to reload. You know, like, otherwise, you just get tired. And also uh, have a good instructor, have a good routine. You no, know, think about, talk to your instructor, talk to what you want to do. Okay, I want to compete. So I read compete now. No, so let's make a plan. That's a uh, twelve weeks. Twelve weeks are a good time to to reach the peak. Like if you are in a in a 
reasonable condition. So start training more, start eating more, talk to someone, or maybe do massage to recover. The time as I was competing, I had massage every Friday. I go with a guy here who used to do massaging the rugby players, the kickboxers. Just put the elbow, it hurts you a lot, but the next time, uh, acupuncture. So you have to treat more your body because you have fine-tuned to, to be stressed. Because the day of the competition is stress. Even if you're the best in the world, you're going to be like a little bit of butterflies. It's the whole day there. You know, it's noise. It's people doing. And the, and the very important thing, one day I was, that, day, that year, I think it was 2003, I went to fight. Won the World Cup in one weekend, went to fight the World Championships the other weekend. Right? So then um, I went to fight with a guy. A, 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 a guy was a champion before. And um, my first fight. So I went there warming up, you know, that butterflies and waiting. They call my fight to go in. And I go in, and I do really remember in the, the stage of there, there were some chairs around, and there's the, the, the grandstands over in Tijuca Tennis Club in Brazil, in Rio. And then there was this a VIP area on the chairs where at the time was Hickson, Carson, uh, all the famous guys, uh, uh, TV people, and also they have a VIP area in the middle. And my mat was exactly in the front of that area. And then I looked to the to the to the stair, to the seats to see before the match and was Elio Gracie and Hicks on sitting watch my match in front of me and said ah, that was like triple the pressure right the guy was a champion <laughs> Elio Gracie and Hicks were sitting there about about 30 meters from me sitting watching like they just they watch all the every fight in those matches and you're sitting watching the fight and I said ah, I could have any other match but <laughs> there was a match in front of them and then they and then uh the fight started and I I said, oh, I'm going to fight in front of Eddie Grace and Hickson Grace. I cannot lose. And I put lots of pressure on my face, on my head, right? And was the champ. So I started to fight nervous. And then in the middle of the fight, I remember having a fight and I think the guy was my half guard. And I was on the board and the guy tried to pass and I moved in there. And uh, I heard some of my, one of my friends screaming, breathe. And that came in my mind. And then it was like, just like that, you know, like not breathing, not moving because it was too dense, too like too many things. The fight, the guys watching the world championship and stuff. And then I and I started breathing. And the fight went like 10 times better. You know, I lost in the end for advantage or for two points or something like that. But everything went out of my mind. So I start to like you know concentrate or not concentrate, but let it flow. So the air went through my body, let it flow and start to fight. Because until there was not fight, I just hold it, worry about. People watch, you worry about where I was, worry about the guy was the champion. And then once you clear your mind, then things were easy. So basically, when you go compete, you are worried about other people. Or about your mom, or your girlfriend, or your wife, or your kids, or someone watching, or the other guy, or who is the guy. And I remember talking to Royce here, and he said, the worst guy, the worst enemy in your mind is a guy with five meters high, just muscles, six arms, three legs, hard teeth. But that's your enemy, you know? That's the guy in your mind. It's not the other guy across the, the thing. He's thinking the same. Maybe in his mind, it's a horrible fight, but you, know, you cannot do what it didn't happen yet. So I think uh, one of the big advice for the, for the guys who are going to fight, doesn't matter if it's a champion already or if it's a beginner, don't worry about anything. Just go there, do your stuff, do your best, try to understand what's happening. And the result will be a consequence of the, that, mem- that moment. Like if you fight a 10 minutes fight with a guy, now, and lose, maybe the next 10 minutes win. The other 10 minutes will be a draw. The other 10 minutes, something else will never be the same and you'll never, you can never predict. So only thing you can do is do your best. So when you go fighting, get in shape, like train hard and don't worry about the rest. Just about you and what's going to happen there. So you try your best. The results, nobody knows. Nice, Paulo. Uh, Paulo, look, let's um, just, uh, we had this conversation before off camera. Um, you, uh, what are the plans for the future? Are you, uh, I know you are, um, you are aiming to, to build uh, a documentary uh, about jiu-jitsu in Australia. Uh, and what are, what are your goals for, for, for this project? Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? I found it super interesting. Yeah, uh, we have, uh, the idea was because what's happening in jiu-jitsu around the world, like the, the history is getting lost. You know, if you go anywhere today, most of the place, not say anywhere, but most of the place, and ask who is Carson Grace? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Or maybe it's that guy, the old guy who used to like this and that. But no, people don't know. Like Carson Grace is a superhero, let's say, for just one of the founders. Who is Helio? Some people come and look, see Helio Fortin, don't know who he is. Who is Carson Grace? Who is this? Who is that? Who is the champion now? We don't need to be up to date every division champion, right? But they, know, they have to know the history. 
where it comes from, where jiu-jitsu comes from, where, where, what, what's the difference between Japanese jiu-jitsu and Brazilian jiu-jitsu? Well, who are the graces? Every, uh, Gracie jiu-jitsu is the same as Brazilian jiu-jitsu. What's Machado jiu-jitsu? What's, uh, I don't know, uh, whatever jiu-jitsu is? Because we give you our names, like Gaha jiu-jitsu, Roots jiu-jitsu. Everything is Gracie jiu-jitsu. Everything came from the graces. There's no other way. And the graces came from the Japanese guy called Koma, you know, and then they learn and develop and came become here. You know, and Gracie jiu-jitsu is the same as Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Brazilian jiu-jitsu is a uh, graphic martial arts. All these, these connections, people are losing. They just want to know about uh, what's happened today and who's the, the latest champion, what's the betting ball who does for jiu-jitsu, does nothing. You know, it's just a, a, a technique to be used in competition. But if you're going to use betting ball in the street, you're going to, you, you are dead. But anyway, it's valid, but you have to know the whole, all the links for the, the, the history of jiu-jitsu in total, in general, in the world. Right? So uh, we have internet if you want to research good, but your average student goes there, doesn't know. The guy gets in the class, doesn't know. We have to talk. I talk in the end of the class. Jiu-Jitsu came from this, this is that. Every class you tell a little story sometimes, you know, for the guys. But uh, the idea of this documentary, so thinking about that, and I've seen that how Australia uh, Jiu-Jitsu scene is growing, growing, growing like crazy now. You know, there's lots of instructors, there's lots of good teachers, bad teachers, uh, good competitors, but, but in general it's growing. And that's important, that's very nice for Australia and for the world. But uh, we had to say how it happened, otherwise it'd be forgotten. No, so how it happened? Okay, uh, before uh, me here, what I heard about was Ed, uh, Carlos Grace Jr. Carlinhos from the President of Federation Hands came here one time and did some seminars and went back. And all the black belts, all the all the, all the Jiu Jitsu guys came and did seminars, went back. I was the first one who stayed, but didn't start with me. You know, so that's why you have to say this the the history of what happened. So well, John Will was the first guy to be interested. Then Peter Debin, then the others, then the others. So we're going to rescue this history and keeping in documents so for the future. And people say, well, how did it happen? How, how did you just came all the way from Brazil to the other side of the world was like this? And give credit to who has credit, you know? And not, not, not want to take the, yeah, not want to take out from anybody. Like the champions now deserve credit. The champion in the past deserve credit. Who's doing things behind the scenes you know, nowadays? Why, like, uh, you so famous? Why, who we'll finish? One day you we'll finish. One day it becomes another, you become another martial arts or something else. Like karate was before us, like kung fu was before us, but you have to know the story. So the, the story and the history. So that's what you're doing now. We are trying to put all together around Australia from the beginning, tell everybody uh, a story, like the guys who are here, how it started, what happened, show the the, the scene. And um, it's a platform. We want to do this documentary to go probably in the movies in two years or something, like the history of jiu-jitsu. And also we want to do a platform where we're going to be updating people and everything like news and podcasts like you do and um, and uh, like little things like Jiu-Jitsu family, Jiu-Jitsu on the road, go to, I don't know, Wagga Wagga or, or some city in the desert and see that Jiu-Jitsu is there, why Jiu-Jitsu is there, what's happening. So make something like, do people have information? You know, and when people have information, people like understand better and uh, develop the, 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 the thing more. So one day, want, everybody wants Jiu-Jitsu in the Olympics, right? There is a movement that's not the International Federation, but uh, the Emirates uh, Federation that is trying to push that because the Sheikh has the money to push. Yeah. Maybe one day Jiu-Jitsu in the Olympics. I don't know, but like, oh, where does this guy come from? From Australia. And uh, what's the history of Jiu-Jitsu in Australia? The history is this. You can keep going, keep going, keep going. Like we have our family trees. We can trace you guys. Who was instructor? Who was he from? And from, from, we can do that. So let's make official. And that's the big thing we are doing now. We already started filming New South Wales. We're going to film um, the instructors in uh, some of them. Keep filming. That's we are evolving uh, a work. So Melbourne, uh, Victoria, in Queensland, then uh, West Australia, uh, South Australia, Northern Territories, Tasmania. When you get everybody together, you're going to edit and then put in the in a, in a format, maybe for the TV, maybe for probably for the movies, for the cinema. And also this platform will be always pushing the, the the community. The idea is because we don't have it. You know, swimming maybe has, uh, judo maybe has, but you don't have it. So I have to make something that everybody will be there and everybody make, makes a stronger community. Well, I think there is definitely a space for it, a need for it. Uh, and I think the, the jiu-jitsu community in Australia will really appreciate that. And in saying that, Paulo, I, I'm a very honorable person uh, and I, I have to say, 
uh, yourself, uh, Bruno, uh, Bruno Pano, Marcelo Rezende. I think you're the three big names in, and that are, uh, made this massive, of course, Peter De Bean, of course, John Will, but you guys made a massive development. And I think it's very important for the whole jiu-jitsu community um, to appreciate and give credit to you guys. Give recognition. Uh, give right. recognition because if uh, I have a business today, right, you made that timing. You, you, Bruno, Marcelo, you guys made the timing right that I could arrive here uh, and started to at least to operate and have something, started from nothing. Of course, uh, same goes for myself and Daniel Lima here in Queensland. There's no doubt that, you know, how many fights we have to... How many fights we have to referee, how many mats we have to carry on our heads, how many people we have to explain jiu-jitsu or it wasn't karate, you know, and so on. So a, a big thanks for you for that, Paulo, and for Bruno and Marcelo as well, and for John Will and for Peter Debin. And super, um, I think it's a honorable thing that every person that's started to teach in Australia or planning to come and teach in Australia should be able to recognize and to respect that. So I have a lot of respect for that, my friend. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks. We 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 did we don't do like for fame or for no uh, now that's uh that's that guy, that's Marcelo, that's what no we do for everyone and because someone has to start, right? So there you start the federation, start these things, now we start to show who's who. And it's not like to pick people, oh, I'm gonna pick Duda instead of Daniel Lima. No, Duda has his his sport, Daniel Lima has his sport, this guy is sport, that guy is sport. So everybody's part of it. It's a community and you have to work on this like True. like everywhere else. Like Hickson wrote his book now, you know. He wrote for him, but that's history. He wrote to people know how his samurai mind is and how to develop from there and learn things. So that's what he tried. He tried to, to improve. I was timing, like you said, was time I arrived in Australia just to surf and <laughs> nowadays I, I'm doing this, all these things about for the martial arts. You know, like uh, you came to Australia for another reason, maybe this and that, and now we have a big successful... I had three boards. Hey, Paulo, I had three boards, mate. <laughs> I came to surf too. <laughs> I... <laughs> Australia, that's a thing. People think Australia, okay, there's kangaroos and surfing. So people come here to kangaroos and they come here, oh, jiu-jitsu is good here too. Yeah. So it's amazing. And uh, it's, that's it. Thank you. And um, it's very important these things you guys do too, like this podcast, you know, and, and, and teaching every day and showing people and refereeing competitions because that's the background. No, some people come the first day the guy comes to the gym, he just wants to learn how, how to defend himself or how to, to move on the floor or how to uh, maybe become a champion. But then he sees, oh, it's much more than this. These guys are nice, you know, when you have the community and they go out for, for fun together and we can see this. So, and have competition. So, it's great, man. I think uh, sports are always good, right? We do sports. Any sports is good for, for your mind and for your body. But because this is our sport, you have to keep moving. Mm. Exactly. Keep pushing forward. And we keep we're keeping like uh uniting, you know what I mean? We keep like uh helping each other and working together in pro of something bigger than us. That's the abundance, you know what I mean? And that's what uh jujitsu is creating this uh, magic world right now for all of us because of that. Everyone's working together to make it better, you know. That's a very good thing in Australia. In America they have you can see like they have lots of uh you no know, separate factions, but here the good thing is like we work together. Everybody from every state, everybody from inside the state to like work together. Even of course, have our competitions, we fight against each other, but on the pro of the, 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 the bigger thing, we, we work together. Yeah, I remember I remember that time I just say that, like you would imagine, I would ima never imagine this, like we were kids there in Brazil, running around, going to the beach, pick some fights in the street, doing things. We never imagined that we'd be here today. Never imagined like that time, jiu-jitsu profession, like George, say George, my instructor say, Jiu-Jitsu profession was just for fun. If you liked too much, it was for fun. You didn't make money. You didn't go anywhere. You just stayed in view. You just become there's a tough fight, but tough guy. But that's it. And then today we have Jiu-Jitsu everywhere in the world. Like crazy thing. We never. When we start training Jiu-Jitsu, we didn't imagine like be teachers or go to Australia or you no know, have a gym. I I used to say this, Paul. If someone to tell, would tell me that I would be teaching in Australia, I would like roll on the floor laughing. You know what I mean? Like it was impossible. Yeah. You know? yeah. In Australia, it's too far away. There's lots of uh, just surfing kangaroos in desert, and uh, and I go there for a bit. That's what happened. And then nowadays, whatever you go, Singapore, I don't know, Malaysia, I don't know, Israel, uh, Japan, um, Korea. We have big. I have lots of gym in Korea. First time I went there, I said, "Oh my God, it's really something here." So everywhere, every Emirates. Who would imagine the Emirates? The prince of the Emirates would be a jiu-jitsu black belt having. 
every school in the Emirates training Jiu-Jitsu, every, every military training Jiu-Jitsu. What the fuck? In the desert, nobody imagined that. That's the time it's coming, but I think it's a good way. And even psychologists <laughs> recommending Jiu-Jitsu now for the patients, eh? Doctors, psychologists, Doctors, everybody. How about that one? Yeah. Well, in the past, you go to the psychologist, you do Jiu-Jitsu. You do Jiu-Jitsu, you go to the psychologist. <laughs> 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 But guys, uh, uh, Paulo Luco, so if anyone like uh, it's in down in Sydney, go and check it out, guys. Go for a, a row. Uh, go see Paulo, Roots BJJ. Very uh, very traditional team, very good team, uh, effective jiu-jitsu that works. Paulo, boy, much appreciated. Um, you want to do, you, you do your last considerations, my friend. Uh, that was a pleasure to have a chat with you. And I hope I'll catch up with you soon in any competitions that will be down in Sydney. Yes. Uh, yes. We are uh, we about the, the documentary. If anybody is interested in the documentary, like to participate, don't be shy. You know, we we want most people as possible. We need instructors and basically the gyms instructors, and from there we go to the students. So contact uh, contact me, uh, uh, the Rich BJJ, right? Info at richbjj.com.au. That's uh, just say what your gym is. Sometimes we try to get everyone, but you cannot get all this. Every story is is a story. Every story is important. About competitions, like competitions are the what make you sharp, what make you have fun, what make you with a name in your mind, with something to to go for. And in the street, use it. If you have to use, use it, because never know what going to be the end. You know, like a people, oh, but I don't want to fight in the street. I don't want to fight in the street too. Nobody wants to. But you learn these to defend yourselves. Two main things you learn in, in you can learn and put your kids in life: swimming and self defense. If they do this, anything else leaves. You know, like and it's a good sport as well. So uh, I think we are in the, the right way. I, I everybody's welcome in every gym. There's no more that fighting against him. But be respectful, be nice, get to the gym, talk to the instructor, you no know, like ask things. Don't go like just thinking you are the best guy you would, because that's very dangerous. But anyway, thank you guys. Do that success there. Guys, I hope you guys be training forever. <laughs> and I see you soon. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thanks so Paul. much, man. Very nice. Uh, to and you I like story. the swords in the back, huh? The three yeah, swords. Yeah. One for you, one for you, and for me. One for each. You can never sword fight sometimes. That's right. That's right. <laughs> right Thank guys, you, Paolo. Thank you, Paolo. Nice chat, man. Selva. Cheers, man. <laughs>